and welcome to the show where we share the stories of the many who intersect with our healthcare system but are rarely heard from. My name is Kevin Poe, founder and editor of Kevin MD. Today on the show, we have Faria Shafi. She's an internal medicine physician and she wrote the Kevin MD article, Who Are the Doctors Who End Their Own Lives? Faria, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Kevin. It's a pleasure being here. So we'll get into your article in a little bit, but first off, can you share your story and your journey to where you are today? Yes, absolutely. So I was uh, born in the beautiful Valley of Kashmir, which is the northernmost part of India, and it's kind of like a disputed territory. Uh, growing up, I grew up between the Middle East and my hometown. My dad was working. He's an internist, and he worked in the Middle East. Um, after finishing high school, I actually landed in the Caribbean and uh, finished my medical school there in the Dominican Republic. Um, I came back and did my residency at the State University of New York at Buffalo, and uh, then finishing up there, I moved to Kansas City at the University of Missouri, Kansas City for my uh, first and so far my only job uh, for the past 15 years as an academician. I am currently an associate professor there. I chair the Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Council. I'm a docent mentor at our six-year BAMD combined program, which is the joy of my career. And I lead the women in medicine group um, at that school. I'm very privileged to be taking care of a very diverse set of patients at Truman Medical Centers, which is our main teaching hospital. And I'm also the medical director for our medical assistant program there. So when you asked me about my journey to where I am today, um, I think a lot of it stemmed from, from um, you know, being and attending four to five years into my job and feeling that I was stuck. I felt that I wasn't seeing my career progress the way that I wanted to. I was more tired. I was more irritable. Um, I felt like I had lost my motivation and that I wasn't really accomplishing much. And um, I didn't realize that a lot of my peers, my colleagues and my friends and my mentors had gone through it or were in certain stages of it and that it was burnout that I was experiencing. And um, I just, you know, wanted to try to fix these feelings. When uh, we were at a council meeting at the American College of Physicians, I belong to the Missouri chapter, I happened to have a conversation with the governor telling him how I felt and how I wanted to do something about it. And before I knew it, I was flying to San Francisco for a wellness champion certification uh, workshop. And that really changed my perspective and what I wanted to do um, and my approach to what I was feeling. So from there, today I'm a certified wellness champion. I co I'm the co-chair of our wellness committee at the Missouri ACP. And I also chair the women in medicine uh, group for our Missouri chapter. In, in between there, I also got married, uh, married to a physician for the past 20 years and have two beautiful kids. They're the ones who keep me real and keep me honest. So the picture that you're describing, even before the pandemic, 50% of physicians experience symptoms of burnout, and that's only exacerbated uh, during COVID-19. What Absolutely. are a few tips um, that you could recommend just off the top of your head to help these physicians out? First thing is to understand what is happening to you and acknowledge it. There is no harm in accepting that things are not going well or you know, that something is out of the norm. The other thing that I would say is we have to get out of this whole perpetuated practice that we feel, you know, we have to fix it all, we have to know it all, we have to do it all. And during COVID times, it's even gotten, I feel worse to some degree, because you know, it's, it's a virus that we're still learning about, you feel even more frustrated, you feel more out of control. What I want to make sure people understand is it's okay to feel like that and build your community around that, right? And try to find ways to connect with other people and figure out what you can do, but understand that if you're not able to deliver what you set out to do, it is okay. I think as physicians, you know, one of the problems that I, I call it a problem that a lot of us have is because most of us are in that perfectionist go-getter gunner personality where, um, you know, we feel like failure is not an option. If you can't be 110%, if you can't be right all the time, you will be frowned upon, upon or you'll be looked down upon. And I think if anything COVID has taught us, it is okay not to know but then try to do your level best, um, try to do the best that you can in that point in time. And the one thing that I want everybody to get into the habit of telling themselves is that you are enough. In this point in time, with what you have and what you are able to do, you're giving it your best shot and that is enough. 
Now, just from hearing your story, it sounds like you, you're you fulfilled by doing so many committees and being part of the medical school and doing so many things outside of your job in clinical medicine. How did you know that all those things were right for you? Um, I guess my question is, uh, when you're a physician who is burnt out and you're looking for avenues outside of clinical medicine, how can they find what's right for them? You know, that realization came after I went to the well-being workshop. Mm -hmm. And people were very honest. And it was almost like that was, you know, finding your safe space, because I felt like that was one of the biggest things that we struggled with. Is it okay to talk about your vulnerability, your imperfections, your stressors, the fact that you're not feeling great, or you're feeling depressed. And I think that for me, finding that safe space, finding that camaraderie, finding that um, community is what changed my outlook and helped me figure out what I wanted to do. Of course, you know, a lot of what we learned during the process is, you know, how to build resilience and how to overcome all these things. They all come with time. And it's not like I picked the first thing that I wanted to do and it worked out really well. And I, you know, was like really excited about it. Um, it was a lot of trial and error figuring out what it was that gave me fulfillment and where I wanted to find that. I thought that I would come back and start, you know, this job of a well-being champion in uh, my place of work, and that would be what I would do uh, for the rest of my career. And I realized that wasn't what I wanted to do. I wanted to do things differently. I wanted to have a different plat platform. So I think, again, getting out of your comfort zone and trying different things and figuring out what works for you. I think was what really helped me. And it definitely was not the first committee I joined. I, I had to try um, different avenues and find uh, what I call my tribe um, that helped me propel my message. So let's transition into your Kevin MD article. Who are the doctors who end their own lives? Now, for those who haven't read that article, can you just walk my audience through it and share the story of why you decided to write it? The article actually came after we had a, it was like a dinner party get together with some of my very closest friends. And um, right within that week, a few days prior to that, a physician, um, a mom within the community had committed suicide. So, you know, one thing led to the other and the conversation dwelled on, you know, what could have happened. And one of my friends actually said, but you know, she was a physician. Why would a physician do that? They have it made. They have everything. And uh, somebody else said something like, you know, irrespective of whatever it is, I don't agree with that. You know, she had kids to think of. Why would you do that? I mean, what kind of a doctor does that? And it was a very uh, sort, of, sort of like an aha moment for me that the general non-physician population or the non-doctor population does not really get what our lives are like. One of the things that happened during that time was I, my husband was sensing um, the angst that was creating within me and that I wanted to uh, shed light on what physician lives are like. So he actually kind of paved the way and we had a very long conversation on what our lives look like. And I, I felt that this was my safe space. These were people that are very close to me. And I felt like I could tell them day in and day out what it is to come back from work or, you know, have to be the face of medicine when you have very little control over what medication your insurance carrier wants to pay for and kind of, you know, being shouted upon and when your patient's upset, that's, you know, you're the face that they're angry with. Or sometimes having to listen to our patient's stories, which uh, break our hearts. And sometimes we can't do a whole lot about it, but we do um, internalize a lot of their grief, a lot of their struggles. And then you kind of have to you know, live with that. And sometimes, you know, some of us do have it easier, but, you know, maybe work is not that hard, but a lot of us, I would say the majority of us are struggling to find that fine line and balance between being the most amazing doctors and being the most amazing dads, partners, moms, brothers, um, sons and daughters, right? So it is very difficult for a lot of us to, to find that balance. So you're constantly juggling, you're constantly having this fight. And the kind of people we are, and the kind of people who want to go to med school, like I said before, are are you know your overachievers or your people that have a lot of empathy and really want to change the world people that really take this job seriously it's not a normal person who's going to sacrifice like 12 to 15 to maybe 16 years of their life to actually get to you know an attending physician's position uh, majority of us do not do it for the money and I, you know it kind of irks me sometimes when people are like but you're a doctor people don't understand 
you know, the amount of financial burdens that we have. That was the background of how it all started. And um, a lot of what I blog about comes up at our dinner table. Mm -hmm. And so we're sitting there and having this conversation. And um, I was like, all right, you know, my son was like, why don't you just write about it? And my husband's like, I think it's a really great idea. See where you can publish it. And I was like, I'm not creating a blog. And then Kevin MD came up because I follow you. And so I was like, all right, I'm going to try to pitch it and see if I can get this across. So that was the background um, of that article. I have a lot of uh, non-physicians who read my blog and listen to this podcast. We talk about physician burnout a lot. And one of the responses I get is that there is a lot of stress in other professions as well outside of medicine. What makes physician burnout different from burnout in other professions? And I know you alluded to some of this previously, but go into more detail. What, what makes medicine different? There are a lot of non-physician lifestyles that have burnout. What makes medicine different is the amount of emotionality and um, the humanity that kind of is tied to it. So, you know, the stressors in some professions are definitely related to maybe all the finances and, and, you know, stressors with the kind of people you're working for. Medicine, especially in this country, is so unique because between the patient and you and the way that you're delivering healthcare, there are so many things that are not within your control, whether it's, you know, the middleman, whether it's the electronic medical record, whether it's the insurance company, you know, whether it is uh, all the other durable medical equipment companies and so on and so forth that you have to deal with. So it's definitely not like a lot of the eight to five, nine to five jobs. Um, And there's, again, that human connection that comes in that also bogs you down, right? Um, And I wouldn't say bogs you down in a negative way, but in the way that our jobs are designed to help and care for people, right? We are habitual empaths. Um, we are habitual fixers. And when we can't fix a problem, when we can't deliver what we promised to do when we went into medical school, it eats up on ourselves, right? So when I talk about layer by layer, we're shredded and broken apart, that's what happens. Because you feel like I should be able to do this, but there's a lot of loss of control that does not allow us to do that. During the COVID pandemic, for example, you see so many physicians um, who again, you know, succumbed to physician suicide. And I was reading an article about this very wonderful physician who basically on her last thing had written, you know, I just couldn't help them anymore. And I think, the, the biggest problem in our profession is we, we have, uh, you know, this need to give empathy, to understand, to try to help, yet we are often put in situations where we feel like that is not reciprocated or given to us, right? An example, again, during the pandemic is we went from within months from being heroes to, you know, the evil people who labeled everybody with that diagnosis because we wanted to make a few extra bucks. And this constant fear that we have that we have to, you know, explain to people that that is not who we are, is the additional stressor and the burnout that is difficult for a lot of us to deal with. We try to deal with it at work, but think about, you know, you come back home to your families, we have jobs that now are putting our families at risk, and you're trying to find that balance and trying to protect your family. I mean, how many doctors did we read about that had camped out in their garages or their backyards? I don't think that there are a lot of professions that end up doing that because you're trying to find that balance on how to do right by your profession and your patient and then how to balance it out for your family. So I, I think that's that's the different part. You know, there are lots of professions where there are, there are you know, I would say finance is one big one, lawyers are one big one, but there aren't a lot of professions where they tell you, you know, the one big risk you're going to take on is the depression and everything you're going to develop. And I think a big part of it is the amount of time that we put into it. I mean, four years of undergrad, med school, residency, fellowship, it's, you're in it for the long haul and there's not a big rate of return, like right at the outset. And to be able to reconcile with that uh, makes it a lot harder. Now, a lot of medical institutions and hospitals are recognizing burnout to their credit and they're responding by offering things like resilience classes, meditation, yoga, What's what's your thoughts on that response? 
I think it's wonderful um, that there is an acknowledgement of it. Uh, I mean, if you look at uh, Dr. Shanafelt, who's been writing about this for decades, um, and then you would have people who'd say it's not a real thing. I think even within the past 15 years that I have been in this profession, people have come a long way to acknowledge that. And I don't think there's any other way out, right? When you survey 25% of your medical school population, uh, and they, I mean, when 25% of the survey population tells you that they are depressed within the first year, two years of medical school, you realize you need to do something differently. And that number doesn't change a whole lot. But there, there were so many studies that actually showed if within those residents, for example, that were surveyed that had depression, if you did made an intervention, if you did something as simple as cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, whether that was just allowing people to talk to someone and just unburden themselves or to have balanced groups or to have yoga um, or to have these wellness opportunities, the risk of perpetuation of the, that depression in that cohort actually dropped by 50%. So I think every little bit counts. Um, I think you know having these things available is excellent, but making sure that you are supporting your physicians where they are able to take the time off to partake in them is the next step. I think it's very important to have, have wellness initiatives, just taking the next step and making sure that there's time carved out where those initiatives can be utilized and made to function for every establishment is important. We're talking to Faria Shafi. She is an internal medicine physician and she wrote the Kevin MD article, Who Are the Doctors Who End Their Own lives. I read an article saying that the equivalent of a medical school class of physicians commit suicide every single year. Now, obviously, we don't want it to get to that point. What are some red flags that physicians should look out for and perhaps turn to professional help after recognizing them? I think um, the the red flags of depression, um, I think, uh, again, for the physicians, we all know that we screen our patients with PHQ-8. So I think those would be the major ones. So you ask people or check in with each other. And if you notice that you know, people around you or you yourself, you are losing, you know, any interest in the hobbies that you had, you're losing interest in activities, you're getting angrier, you're feeling frustrated, you're feeling stuck, um, and you're making mistakes, um, and you're not able to put in your best effort, you're feeling tired, um, all of those things, they're not that different than all the signs that we screen for, for depression and anxiety, but you know, those are all important. You know, are you rested enough? Are you sleeping enough? Are you able to shut your mind off uh, when you need to? Are you able to take out time for yourself and feel happy and partake in things that gave you joy? If you feel that that is not you, there is something seriously wrong. Again, if you, again, are somebody who's an excellent student, an excellent physician, who's never had trouble concentrating, and now suddenly you can't seem to, you know, pass a class that should be really easy for you, and suddenly your performance has gone from an A-level student to a C-level student, uh, and it's not the difficulty of the course, something is wrong. So for every level, having those check-ins and um, asking ourselves those questions and doing our internal screens and doing screens for each other is important. There are so many um, establishments that have said, uh, started programs like check-in one, check-in two, like check into yourself and then check in to another friend and make sure that you're doing that consistently and often enough. I think those are the things that we can do to figure out where we are. Now, can you share some resources that physicians can look online if they're feeling some of these symptoms of burnout? So um, I would say every major organization has their own uh, wellness website. So I can tell you about the American College of Physicians. Um, they have their own wellness hub. They have their own wellness page, and that's an easy one to go. American uh, Academy of Pediatrics, uh, the emergency physician cohorts, they all have excellent resources. I think, you know, even if we're trying to just find mindfulness resources, things that are cheap, easy and people are happy to share them, you know, you have so many apps like the mindfulness apps like Calm, et cetera. So we can definitely go to those resources. But uh, even within our own establishments, um, I would say Google, I mean, put in your search wellness. I would be surprised if there's any organization or establishment, establishment left in the country that has not made that a priority for their workforce. And I'm not just talking about uh, physicians and hospitals and healthcare related professions. I'm talking about professions all across the country. I, I think that it would be something that would be very easily available. 
Now, if you're a physician who is burnt out and you've gone through all these recommendations and it's not improving, at what point does it become more about the job itself? And at what point should that physician consider either cutting down or maybe looking for a new position? Being aware and sifting through and figuring out if it is their job that's doing it. And again, you know, that can be done with counseling, that can be done with finding peer mentoring groups, that can be done with having um, balanced groups where you're able to kind of find your safe space and talk about it. And you realize that it is your job that's really bogging you down to the point where you're not productive. So you're there, but you're not present. Uh, Mindfulness is a big gauge of it. If you're just doing stuff robotically and you're starting to make mistakes um, and you're not really present in the moment. That to me is a big reason to step away from what we're doing. And it doesn't mean that you have to step away completely. It means you have to figure out what part of that job is leading to this. And, you know, for me, I would say some part of it was the autonomy, the ability to have my schedule uh, where I had more control over my life. And sometimes it's a simple step like going up and asking your superior, can I make this change? Because this is what I'm experiencing and I cannot be functional without that. Um, So sometimes for me, that was as simple as it was. The other thing is if you're feeling you're at that point, so a lot of our state organizations actually have or uh, physicians that specifically, um, and I would say psychiatrists specifically that deal with physicians in distress, that would be a time to go ahead and seek that out and move away from your clinical practice uh, or what is burning you out for a short period of time to kind of reset. And I think that is really important to do. One of my very close friends does this for the state of Missouri and for the state of Kansas. And uh, that's what gives him fulfillment in his job is the number of physicians that have been able to step away and then go back to their practice with fulfillment, of course, making changes um, in the things that had actually led to the burnout. And my final question, what is your take home message that you want to leave with the Kevin MD audience? I would say um, there are, the most important thing is uh, it is okay to say no. In our profession, we get asked to do so many things, uh, sometimes simultaneously, um, and we feel like we have to do this to fix it. It's okay to say no. I would also say the other takeaways are it is okay to be vulnerable. It is okay not to be perfect. It is completely okay to fail and then rise from that. Failure is an option. And I think in our profession, we are constantly told that it's not. And I think we need to get away from it. It is also important to realize that you have to keep telling yourself that you are enough. You need to focus on yourself, your well-being, and it is okay to prioritize me. That's the other problem we in the physician world um, experience that we take care of everyone else. We develop caregiver fatigue, which is another thing that leads to a lot of depression and we don't prioritize ourselves. It is okay to ask for help. It is okay to be a voice for what you believe in. And the most important takeaway for the physician community um, and especially for the medical students, the residents who are out there and the people who are starting out their career is remember that medicine is a part of your life. It is not your entire life. That's the most important thing that I can say is find joy in other things. And I think you'll have a much, much longer career in medicine. Well, thank you so much for sharing your insight and time. And thanks again for being on the show. Thank you so much, Kevin. I really appreciate you.